So hello and good evening. Welcome everyone. I assume you can hear me okay? Yes, and we're okay online. I just want to check the mic is okay. Yeah, everything's great. So um, good evening and a very, very warm welcome to you. I'm absolutely delighted to see so many of you in person today and I hear there's many more uh, joining online. So my name is Professor Francis Bowen and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Social Sciences here at UEA. Thanks for joining us for UEA's second inaugural lecture of the spring term. It's really great to be here this evening. It says it's great to be here this evening on my script, but I really mean it. It's great to be here this evening. And welcome to those of you joining us in the study center here, Julian Study Center, and also those of you joining via YouTube. I hear from Christine, we have some of you who got up extremely early to join us from Australia and New Zealand. I hope you got online. Uh, do say in the chat, I think there's an online uh, sort of thing happening there, uh, where you're joining us from. I'd also like to welcome our speaker this evening, Professor Christine Cocker. So Christine uh, is a professor of social work and head of the School of Social Work here at UEA. Christine grew up in the North Island of New Zealand and lived in Pretoria in the Republic of South Africa as an exchange student when she was 16. It does say the year here, 1983. Uh, during the apartheid regime. It was this life-changing experience that led her into a career in social work. After returning from the year abroad, she studied social work at Massey University in New Zealand. Starting in the late 1980s, Christine spent 15 years working for the London Borough of Southwark, managing child and family teams, child protection services, adoption service, and created one of the first multidisciplinary mental health projects for care experienced young people. in the UK. Uh, in 1996, Christine completed a master's in applied theology at the University of Oxford with a dissertation on the religious development of looked after children. Christine left local authority social work in 2001 and worked for a national voluntary sector agency, the Bridge Child Care Development Service, which specialized in undertaking serious case reviews. It was during her time here that Christine was first awarded a research grant from the EU for a multi-country project examining the mental health of care-experienced children. In 2003, Christine began her first academic post as principal lecturer at Middlesex University before joining the School of Social Work at UEA as a senior lecturer in 2013. She was awarded a PhD in psychological medicine from the University of Glasgow in 2019. Christine maintains strong links with practice as she's currently an independent member of a local authority permanence panel and chair of a local authority's children academy. Christine researches and writes about transitional safeguarding, social work and sexuality, and social work with looked after children. Christine has recently added to her considerable contributions here at UEA by taking on the role of the head of school of social work last year so I'd like to take this opportunity to personally thank you for all you're doing in that role. Um, and all, all of your colleagues here, Christine, your colleagues, students, and friends of the School of Social Work can rest easy that you're representing and advocating for social work and for social workers expertly at the faculty and university level. So please join me now in welcoming Christine Cocker to give her inaugural lecture. Are we all right for sound? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to uh, begin, thank you, Francis, um, by thanking all of you um, to, for coming to this event. There are many people present tonight in this lecture theatre and online who have known me for a very long time and in many, many different uh, capacities. We have people joining us from all over the world, and I particularly wanted to thank my friends and family joining from Australia and New Zealand who have had to get up jolly early to watch this. That is some dedication. Kia ora e te whanau, haere mai koutou katoa. You are most welcome here. One of the most wonderful things about this talk and inaugural talks generally is that for the speaker, for me, it's an opportunity for people who know me from many different areas in my life to come together and hear what I do at work. A great number of you are very dear academic colleagues I have worked with for years at Middlesex University and at UEA, 
or who I have met over the time I have been an academic. There are too many of you to name everyone, but I did want to say a special thank you to the people I have written books with, Professors Lucille Lane, Helen Kosis brown and Trish hafford Lexfield. You get to know someone in a very different way when you write a book with them. And I'm on my third book now with Trish, which says something about the support she has given me over my career. Thank you. And there are other books being written now, so I will shortly be adding Des Holmes from Research and Practice and A.D. Cooper to the collaborators list once we finish our book on transitional safeguarding early next year. I also wanted to say thank you to Professor Helen Minnis and Dr. Helen Sweeting from the University of Glasgow, who were my PhD supervisors. Everyone's PhD is a unique journey, and mine certainly was that. They are both amazing academics and taught me so much about how to write from a different disciplinary perspective. I also wanted to say a huge thank you to Professors Michael Preston Shute and Susie Bray, who have been the most excellent friends and mentors to me. I'm very grateful to you both. Susie is a fantastic photographer, and it is her photo that is on screen tonight at the beginning of my talk. It's a tree in Lake Wanaka in the South Island of New Zealand. I'd also like to thank people I work with outside of academia in the different roles that I have had over the years in the London Borough of Tar Hamlet and in the London Borough of Haringey. You also continue to influence my thinking. And finally, I need to thank my partner, Aidy, for her unwavering support. I met my match on the workaholic stakes when I met her 30-odd years ago now, that is for sure. This evening, I will talk about families, something that is common to us all. We all have one, or maybe more than one, belong to one or not, whether that be a birth family, an adopted family, a family of choice, a friendship-based family, or any other way we might have of defining our sense of belonging in a group of, to a group of people who are related or connected to us in some way. But what this term means for us as an individual and our experience of it is different for each of us. Families are complicated. They are complicated across the passage of time, across cultures, across place and space. We'll get into some of that um, tonight. You'll not be surprised from the title of my talk to know that I'm going to be talking quite a lot tonight about queer families, those families with lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, or non-binary parents. I'll use the term LGBT plus to talk about these families. I'm going to be talking mainly about parenting this evening. So much of my scholarship work since becoming an academic has touched on this area of practice. My motivation for studying this topic was because the family I have created in the UK is a family with lesbian parents. The experiences that we have had, both good and bad, have certainly given me insight into some, situa into some situations others face in similar circumstances. Being an insider, of course, also presents many challenges for an academic, but they can be addressed. When I began publishing in this field about 15 years ago, there wasn't a great deal written in the UK on this topic. Talking to people and hearing their stories, hearing how situations have improved for some and not others has been sobering. But before I tell you some of these stories, let me set the scene. As a social structure, the family occupies a unique place in our society. <clears throat> it is a private social institution subjected to a lot of public and political influence. Article 8 of the Human Rights Act 1988 says we all have a right to a private and family life. Those of you who are social workers will know that this is a qualified right. This means a public authority can sometimes interfere with this right to respect for a private and family life, if it is in the interest of the wider community or to protect other people's rights. I'll return to this a little later to talk about belonging and care experience children. But importantly, family is a social construction. It changes over time. 
But what does family mean in terms of the experiences of LGBT plus people? The last four decades have seen unprecedented legal changes in support of LGBT equality in many Western nations across the world, including the United Kingdom, many countries in Europe, New Zealand, Australia, the United States and Canada in the main. These legal changes include equalising the age of consent for sexual relationships, equal rights and civil partnerships, marriage and equal access to public goods and services. Many more lesbians, gay men, bisexual, queer and trans non-binary persons are now choosing to have families of their own. Some individuals will have birth children, some will use a range of co-parenting arrangements and others will have their families via adoption. However, societal discourses about families remain entrenched within a heteronormative and cisgendered framework and I think there is a danger that the diversity of how lesbians, gay men, trans and non-binary people create family and family structures is not valued particularly the complex family forms and structures that we form in our lives. Do not forget that there are over 70 countries in the world where homosexuality is illegal and some where the death penalty exists. The numbers of countries where LGBT plus partnerships enjoy the same legal status as heterosexual marriage is small in comparison with those where it is illegal. This does not mean that homophobia and heterosexism do not exist within these societies. They do. There are differences and similarities in LGBT plus families about how our understanding of the terms sexuality and gender affect how we understand the parenting role. These terms are not the same. Many studies use the term LGBT plus to describe non-heterosexual parenting but do not specifically address the T or the plus. Yes, every one of us has a sexuality and a gender. However, the more complex ways in which heteronormative understandings of these terms plays out in LGBT plus families needs examining. Throughout the presentation, I will use the word parent and parenting rather than fathering and mothering. I use this to avoid and reinforce the sex-sex stereotyping that occurs within family life. The irony is that some people do want these labels used to describe their parenting role. I'm not opposed to that. There is something for me about people having choice and diversity about the names we use to describe us as parents that is important here. For so long, we have had to create our own names and identities that befit the roles within families that we have. And there are still no words to describe some of our roles and relationships. A big shout out here to the adults who do not have children of their own but contribute so much to the lives of those children they form connections with. This is a vitally important role and one that is undervalued within our Eurocentric society. Parents and children need these connections for children to thrive as they offer support on so many different levels. My talk tonight will begin by summarising developments in the UK, first focusing on lesbian parents, then gay parents, then trans and non-binary parents, and finally bisexual parents. If we go back 40 years and start with lesbian parenting, there are a small number of publications that offer historic insights into the experience of lesbian parents in the 1970s and the 1980s. Many of the lesbians that these authors spoke to had conceived children within marriages to men that had then ended. And these women had then experienced custody battles. The negativity of the courts towards lesbians at that time meant that the majority of women facing such custody battles lost custody of their children because of their sexuality. This was in marked contrast to how the courts at the time treated heterosexual women where custody arrangements for children almost always favoured mothers. During the 1980s, lesbian feminists began to challenge the heteronormative nuclear family status quo by creating their own families of choice, including having children through self and donor insemination as single mothers, in couples or in collective households. 
The feminist foci on sexual choice, women's health, and reproductive rights provided a context for lesbians to find ways to have children outside of heterosexual relationships. It wasn't until the 1980s that social science researchers began investigating the outcomes for children who were raised by lesbian parents. The work of one psychologist in the UK deserves particular mention. The work of Susan Gollenbach, who is an absolute hero of mine, she is a professor at the University of Cambridge, compared the psychological, sexual, educational and social outcomes of children raised by lesbians compared with children raised by single heterosexual mothers. This was important in showing that the children of lesbians were just as likely as children growing up in heterosexual families to have good mental health, to have positive relationships with peers, and to have good relationships with both male and female adults. Five years after Susan Gollenbach published her first study in 1983, in 1988, the UK government passed legislation that forbade schools from promoting homosexuality, describing it as a pretended family relationship. Can you imagine having your family described in this manner? This was the year that I arrived in the UK. This legislation, Section 28, had an impact on lesbian and gay families through the 1990s. In this environment, lesbians and gay men choosing to have families and create families made personal decisions that had political implications. Section 28 remained law until 2003 when it was removed from the statute books. Most of the early studies in the 1980s focused on lesbian parents. The research literature about gay men's parenting and outcomes from their children began 10 to 15 years later. In terms of the outcomes for the children parented by gay men, the results are broadly similar to lesbian mothers, with children raised by gay men exhibiting no more psychological differences than their heterosexual counterparts. Indeed, some studies suggest that children of gay fathers may have better outcomes than those of heterosexual parents in some psychological domains, less gender stereotyping and less internalising and externalising behaviours. However, in their review of 63 studies about gay parenting that were, uh, was, uh, covered the period from 1979 to 2016, Carnero and colleagues found that the literature about gay parenting presents it as more diverse than lesbian parents. They suggest that this is due to the way in which gay men become parents via co-parenting, adoption, fostering or surrogacy. In addition, social attitudes play a role in this process. Whilst both lesbians and gay men defy traditional gender roles, Gay men have experienced different types of homophobia than lesbians in their bid to become parents, particularly around paedophile narratives observed in many political discourses associated with legal changes. And if you want to have a look at this, see some of the Hansard transcripts from the debates in the Houses of Parliament in the UK around lowering the age of consent for gay men in, uh, to 16 in 2003 and debates about adoption law reform in 2002. You'll see what I mean. Negative stereotyping in relation to HIV has also affected gay men who are HIV positive when thinking about their options for becoming parents as well as the advice they receive about parenting. Moving on to trans and non-binary people's experience of parenting, I was involved conducting a systematic literature review which was published in 2019. The empirical evidence about parenting with people with diverse gender identities is limited. It is an under-researched area. Studies exploring issues for non-binary parents are also really uncommon. In our systematic literature review, we found that whilst lesbian and gay families are viewed as having pioneered new family forms, you know you're getting old when people refer to you as a pioneer, there is evidence from the literature to show that trans and non-binary experiences of parenting are distinct from wider lesbian, gay and bisexual experiences. Transition is a process, not an event, and is different for every trans person. Our findings showed that trans people are as invested 
and committed to their families as any other persons. But there is a fear about how being trans might affect family relationships, particularly where coming out is trans after becoming a parent. There are also differences between trans women and trans men's journey to parenting. Trans women are more likely to become parents before their gender transition at younger ages and with lower socioeconomic status. Trans men and gender non-binary people are more likely to become parents after gender transition. The other group of people whose needs and experiences are not often discussed in the literature are parents who are bisexual. Although they are located within both heteronormative and same-sex partnerships and family arrangements, the ways in which their bisexuality informs these can present challenges for people in maintaining a sexual identity that is often marginalised within society and presented negatively. Engaging in relationships that acknowledge people's bisexuality and sexual identity challenges societal expectations of sexual attraction, partnerships and family making, with people feeling that they do not belong in either a lesbian or gay or heterosexual world. This unhelpful positioning ignores the potential for creating family forms that are not based solely on biology in family relationships, but can also include family members who are there from choice. Uh, shout out here also to Dr. Fiona Tasker, who's a reader in psychology at Birkbeck, for all the um, leading work that she's doing in this area. She did a lot of work with um, Susan Gollenbach over the years and has and continued to um, work in this area. Moving on to um, another um, aspect of parenting, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, adoption and some of the work I've done in this field. Having a family through fostering or adoption is now possible for many LGBT plus individuals and couples. Applicants who are single or in same-sex relationships are now encouraged to apply by many local authorities and voluntary sector agencies in the UK. However, it is important to remember that no one has the right to become an adopter or a foster carer. But in the UK, people who are LGBT plus can approach adoption agencies to ask for an assessment. Agencies assess applicants to ensure that all adopters and foster carers have the necessary qualities and experiences to care for children who have had traumatic and abusive experiences. It is in these assessments that the challenges that many LGBT plus applicants have handled successfully in their own lives may well be regarded as assets in the assessment process. In addition, many LGBT plus applicants are approaching adoption as their first choice for creating a family, and they are often open to adopting children who are older and of different ethnic and racial backgrounds in comparison to heterosexual adopters. The research evidence concerning the experiences of lesbians and gay men of adoption in the UK is small, but it's developed quite a lot over the last 20 years. I am proud to have contributed to this research. The reported experiences of LGBT plus individuals and couples approaching fostering and adoption agencies in the UK now is much more positive than in the past, with LGBT plus people expecting to be treated fairly and their application being assessed on its merits. This more positive approach has been supported by changes in the legislation, in itself reflecting changing social attitudes to the family. In 2002, the Adoption and Children Act was passed, which allowed lesbian and gay couples to jointly adopt for the first time, although it wasn't enacted until December 2005. Hitherto, only one person in a same-sex partnership could adopt a child. Local authority and the courts viewed lesbian and gay couple applications as single-person adoption applications. The other partner had to apply for a joint residence order, which lasted until the adopted child turned 18. This legislation, the Adoption and Children Act 2002, <coughs> marked a change in public policy by acknowledging the existence of same-sex families. From this point forward, Additional legislation regarding civil partnerships in 2004 and same-sex marriage in 2013 has enabled further equality between the relationship status of same-sex couples and heterosexual couples in England, Scotland and Wales and civil partnerships in Northern Ireland. 
although it is only since January 2020 that Northern Ireland has allowed same-sex marriage. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my family now to illustrate what this meant in reality. I am a parent myself to three children, one of whom I gave birth to. One my partner gave birth to, and the youngest we adopted when he was nearly two. My partner and I have been to court three times in order that the relationships between us and our children will legally endure beyond the age of 18. So we have had the state in our sitting room assessing our parental ability, not once, but twice. I have had social workers in my house and directly experienced discrimination and homophobia from them. I will mention briefly a story of when a social worker turned up at our house to complete a Schedule II assessment. That is an adoption assessment that is undertaken for the courts about the adults who want to adopt a child. And our local authority sent around the social worker to undertake the assessment. She arrived with her papers and sat down and said something like, hello, it's lovely to meet you. I've been reading your file and blah, blah, blah. And we said, no, that doesn't sound right. She then said, oh, well, I understand this about you, blah, blah, blah. And we then said, no, that's not us. And at that moment, an absolute look of horror appeared on her face as she realised she had brought with her the file on the other lesbian couple she had been given to assess. After all, lesbians are all the same, aren't they? There are many other experiences that we had with this particular local authority which weren't brilliant, but stood in stark contrast from our assessing local authority, which really was very good. It is also worth pointing out that this mistaken identity experience is really common for black and minority ethnic people, not just lesbians. Having talked about the research regarding um, parenting and adoption, I want to um, move on to discuss aspects of belonging and community. As a parent, one of the commonalities for all families and a point of intersection for the state is school. In 2015, I was involved in an EU study looking at homophobia in schools. As a part of this work, we interviewed a number of lesbian and gay parents, including adopters. There were some really interesting issues raised by these participants about their experience of parenting and schooling that speaks to the confidence that LGBT parents have to develop in dealing with other people's questions about their families. One gay father said, LGBT people are very accustomed to dealing with and negotiating difficulties. Two gay adopted fathers commented that for their children, having gay dads wasn't the biggest issue for the school. The reasons for the children's adoption was more pertinent in terms of the effect that this had on the children's ability to learn in the classroom. Potential misunderstandings can emerge because of the specific needs of adopted children and the ongoing support often required from education and CAMS due to the pre-adoption life experiences. There is concern that agencies may have a negative view of lesbian and gay parents and see their help seeking in these contexts as indicative of problematic parenting rather than an act of strength. Turning to experiences with other parents, this quote is quite indicative. And I read here, where the gay thing plays out differently is that every single person who comes to our house asks about it, where you got them, where they came from, particularly children, as the parents are slightly embarrassed about it. In the adoption group at school, adoptive parents worry about whether they should tell someone or not. We are the opposite. There is no way you can pretend as gay men. It has to be explained. And I'm endlessly telling people the story of how we came together. According to our participants for adopted children, their adopted family structure was not their main concern. For example, one parent said, class is totally the issue for the children coming into a posh family where nothing about their previous lives that would make any sense. Definitely that was the thing. The changes that they have made have been totally about that and not about gay parenting. What is similar for parents and families across the spectrum I am describing is that heteronormativity also carries with it the constant threat and experience of homophobia 
for some for same-sex families and transphobia for trans and non-binary families. This is not something that heterosexual families experience. It marks out LGBT plus families as different. Since this is, unfortunately, an altogether common experience for LGBT plus people, we are often adept at negotiating these spaces. In addition, how children come to be in lesbian and gay families frequently differs from heterosexual families. There is an assumption that the children of heterosexual parents are birth children. This is not the same for children of lesbian and gay parents, even when they are birth children. A further assumption in most school environments is that all children are being raised within heterosexual families. This means that same-sex families are constantly coming out within school and other public service settings. This is a recurring situation lesbians and gay parents face every year with every new class teacher and at the school gates with other parents. They are required to continuously manage the heteronormative interface between private and public spaces within the home and community for their children. This would similarly apply to trans and non-binary parents and their children. So I've talked mainly about parents up till now, and I now want to turn to um, think about what it is that um, children and LGBT families say. In 2010, the Ch Centre for Family Research at the University of Cambridge conducted some interviews for Stonewall with, for 80, with 82 children and young people who have lesbian, gay or bisexual parents to learn more about their experiences both at home and school. The study um, found that very young children with gay parents tend to not see their families as being any different to those of their peers. Many of the older children said they saw their families as special and different, but only because all families are special and different, though some felt that their families were a lot closer than other people's families. The report found that children with gay, lesbian and bisexual parents like having gay parents and would not want things to change, but sometimes they wish that other people were more accepting. In the review of trans and non-binary families we undertook, many children of trans parents said similar things. I want to pause here and become a bit of a social work professor for a moment, because I can, and take a sideways step to think now about the word belonging. I want to think about belonging in relation to geographical community and how we understand this. Did you know that just over half of Britons live within 20 miles of communities where they were located when they were 14 years of age? I didn't know that until I was um, doing my work for this. So our links with people and places matter. And I know I'm probably the biggest outlier in terms of statistics because it was about 12,000 miles between where I used to live at 14 and now. Um, our links with people and places matter. In her book uh, titled Belonging, a Culture of Place, Bell Hooks talks about her relationship to her home state of Kentucky. She absolutely understands the contradictions embedded in that region of the United States for her as a black woman. The racial politics, the history, and the dynamics that are a part of understanding how place and space interconnect are vital to her understanding of herself and where she belongs. This is the case for many LGBT plus people, as a similar story can be told about the negative impact of coming out on belonging within communities where they grew up. Rejection by families of birth and by communities is incredibly powerful. This is not the story for all LGBT youth, but for some. In response to this, LGBT families are adept at creating communities where we are fully accepted and not rejected. My younger daughter affectionately calls our lesbian parenting community in Stoke Newington the lesbian mafia. Take from that what you will. I think adopted families are very good at building connections like this too. It is almost like there is an unwritten understanding about a commonality of experience with another parent who is, a, who is a stranger, where adoption is also part of their life. I'm not just talking about the challenging moments of adoption, but also the joys. I am reminded of K. Lil Gibran's poem on children. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. 
They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. So let us now think about how belonging applies to children and relationships that they have with families within our society, particularly where there is no biological link, but where there is a legal imperative, such as in adoption or with some types of state care, where the local authority shares parental responsibility for children in its care. I want to think about the difference between belonging as a relational construct, where this is demonstrated through relationships, as opposed to belonging as a legal construct that brings with it histories of property and ownership. Ask a social worker these days about which models and methods are influential on their practice, and they are more likely um, than not to mention relationship-based practice. Another very eminent UEA professor by the name of David Howe once said, if relationships are where things developmentally can go wrong, then relationships are where they are most likely to be put right. Forgive my slight detour now. It's linked to exploring the act of belonging from another perspective, a structural perspective. It is meant to challenge what it is we mean when we actively talk about the act of caring for another and love using a very small example. 20 years ago, when we collected our son from the foster placement where he was living to come and live with us permanently, we were given his belongings in black bin liners. The label says 70 litre capacity for waste disposal. These were our son's earthly possessions from his birth mother and his birth father, things that were and are part of his history. These things were not rubbish. I have been teaching social work students for nearly 20 years now, and without fail, I always talk about why it is important not to do this. Black bin liners are not suitcases. On January the 19th of this year, the National Youth Advocacy Service found that four in five looked after children still have their possessions moved in black bin liners when they change homes. One young person in the report said, it made me feel like I was worthless, just as rubbish is. This echoes the experiences that many LGBT people have of feeling like they are rubbish because of the ways their families and communities have rejected in them in the past. We know LGBT young people are overrepresented in the number of our young people who have serious mental illnesses. To take this back to the topic this evening, this does not engender a sense of belonging, quite the opposite. And not using a black bin bag to transport a care-experienced child or young person's belongings is a seemingly small thing to change. In creating a sense of belonging, identity, nurture, and community for children, a basic quality in the care that we provide is not too much to ask. In my work both at the university and in some of the other roles I have, I have met some of the most dedicated social workers and public sector workers and leaders I could ever hope to meet. We need their leadership here to disrupt these poor caring practices. These children are part of our communities and how we care for them, how we value them matters, just as it does with LGBT families. Bell Hooks reminds us that love is an action, never simply a feeling. I want to ask a challenging question as I move into the penultimate part of my presentation now. Are we still a radical alternative to heterosexual parenting? As I've already mentioned, over the last um, 20 years, the numbers of lesbians, gay men, and trans non-binary people having families has markedly increased, although probably there were a lot more in the past who we don't know about as they were hidden from history. This is often referred to as the gaby boom era, and the literature now includes references to LGBT persons becoming parents via fostering and adoption, as well as via birth and surrogacy. In 2020, one in six adoptions in England were to same-sex couples. This shows not only the significant contribution that same-sex adopters are making in the adoption field, but also the diversity of ways in which same-sex couples in this instance are choosing to have families, which is not always via birth. However, over this time, ideas about family 
continue to be contested also within LGBT plus communities with more critical perspectives expressed within the lesbian and gay community about this gayby boom. So what do I mean here? Lesbians and gay men choosing to become parents have been seen as endorsing assimilationist practices and embracing heteronormativity in order to achieve acceptability. For some, this narrative has damaged decades of debate and discussion about the validity of alternative family structures and forms within LGBT communities that did not privilege biology and stood outside of state control and scrutiny. Spade and Wolfe argue that marriage does nothing for the status of the majority of same-sex parents, as it is a tool of gendered social control, material distribution, and protection of material wealth. The danger of marriage equality is that it legitimizes certain types of LGBT partnerships and family forms. It creates a barrier between those that are state-sanctioned and those lesbians and gay men who choose to live their lives outside of this legal structure. Their families and roles may not be valued in the same way. This danger applies equally to those families who are seen as legitimate and those who are not. Despite all the changes in the legal position for LGBT plus parents in the United Kingdom, homophobia, transphobia and heterosexism still exist. I would argue that the social work practice and research communities are not immune from these biases. The literature that has developed since the 1970s illustrates what Clark refers to as reflecting a liberal equality perspective, which is largely reductionist and seeks to identify differences between various types of families and the resulting impact on the children growing up within these families. As far back as 1987, the research findings about lesbian mothers being just like any other mother were criticised from a feminist viewpoint as making us once more invisible. Subsequent feminist writing has added much to this earlier viewpoint about lesbian parenting being as good as heterosexual parenting in response to heteronormative critiques of alternative families. I'm going to critique this very briefly by looking at what we know about lesbian parenting, although I think that similar arguments can be made across other types of families within the LGBT plus community. In his research investigating social workers' assessments of lesbian prospective adopters, Steve Hicks from the University of Manchester created three typologies of good and bad lesbians. And those typologies were the man-hater, the militant, and the pedestal of virtue. virtue. He argued that the lesbians were, that were most likely to be approved as foster carers or adopters were, and I quote, able to deal with anti-lesbian prejudices of birth families, some children, young people in the panel, were not threatening to gender norms, were integrated with heterosexuals, likely to know men, have male role models, present positive images of men, be integrated into the wider heterosexual community and family, where childcare abilities were emphasised as paramount over issues of sexuality, were non-militant, non-radical, not political, and not too feminist. That's your pedestal of virtue. This publicly acceptable face of lesbian parenting hardly portrays it as a politically rebellious act. There is a further major problem with the literature, as Gab reminds us, and I quote, whilst time moves forward and many contemporary equality rights may be indeed progressive, we should not lose sight of who gets written in and who gets written out of the story of LGBT parenthood that gets told. It is, and this is me talking now, it is white middle-class perspectives that continue to dominate the literature about lesbian motherhood and broader LGBT parenting, certainly within the UK context. Diversity has been sorely overlooked, which means there is very little information that describes the experiences of lesbian mothers from ethnic minority backgrounds, lesbians who are working class, lesbians who have disabilities, a health condition, who are older, or any intersection of these factors. We know very little about these families. Much of what I have said so far has centred on the insider-outsider binary that hitherto preoccupies research undertaken with lesbian parents. 
moves towards theorizing the in-between spaces occupied by lesbian parents and others uh, who embrace alternative family forms, encourages a debate that does not position these parents as radicals or reactionaries. Instead, it acknowledges both the political act that LGBT parenting is alongside the ordinary and everyday actions and interactions that being a parent encompasses. The literature is moving towards identifying and exploring queer parenting as something that challenges gender binaries in the ways lesbians and gay men challenged the sex binaries many years before. And these are important developments in feminism and feminist research, as well as in social work and social work research. In conclusion, LGBT issues have always been located outside of the mainstream in terms of practice, teaching, and research. For social workers working with LGBT individuals who are mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, foster carers, extended family members, and connected persons, being aware of the effects of heteronormativity and cisnormativity on their own thinking and behaviors as well as the effect on the lived experiences of these LGBT individuals is vital. It's time for other families to have their stories told and their experiences and struggles recognized and valued for the contribution they can make to our community. They will be all the richer for them. The key message is to be culturally aware and understand the history and context for LGBT plus families. Developing self-awareness, not applying conventional heteronormative models of family, and being aware of the different homo and transphobic experiences that LGBT plus parents have as part of their ordinary and everyday family life will assist all of us to not be part of the problem of reinforcing normalization, which colludes with the oppression of LGBT families. It's from valuing the strengths and the diversities of families and family forms that we can truly reimagine belonging and communities in different ways. Relational belonging is best summed up by Bronfenbrenner, who said, and I quote, in order to develop normally, a child requires progressively more complex joint activity with one or more adults who have an irrational emotional relationship with their child. Somebody's got to be crazy about that kid. That's number one, first, last, and always. Nothing about that statement would imply that LGBT plus families aren't completely capable of providing that sense of belonging, that over the top, completely crazy and dedicated love to their children, however they become part of their family. After all, it's what happens within families, not the way families are composed, that seems to matter most. Thank you. It's not often I find myself speechless, I'll say why in a minute afterwards, but um, please, please, um, let's enjoy Christine again. <laughs> do, we have, do we have any questions? There's plenty, lots and lots of food for thought in that presentation today. I'm sure Christine would be happy to answer some questions, either with a professor hat on, a practitioner hat, a leader hat, a who parent hat. Um, any questions or, or comments, ideas for Christine? People online, you're absolutely welcome to type in the chat. We've got somebody keeping an eye. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, we've got a microphone coming down for you, Charlene. Christine, this was an amazing presentation. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. I just wanted to know how how did you how I mean how did you feel when you were preparing for this talk and how, you know, emotionally, just what was the process like to have to prepare and then talk about the research that you've invested so much time in but is also very personal to you. Thank you for the question. Um 
It's a really hard thing preparing for a talk like this because you're summarising quite a lot of, you know, your work. And um, it is something that I feel I have had a, um, a bit of a vested interest in in, in, in terms of the, the work that I've done. But I've worked with some fantastic people, including colleagues in this room who have really helped um, my thinking and, and, and also have led some, I haven't led them, other people have. I'm thinking of Jeanette and her study with LGBT young people in care. I mean, that's, that's a game changer. And, and, and I think it's, it's been wonderful to be a part of something that's created um, options and, or, or kind of shone a light, I suppose, on, on, uh, on practice and in a way try to then improve practice. That's why I admire the work of Susan Gollenbock so, so much, because I think her work, although it's quite reductionist in its nature, and she would acknowledge that, it, it's changed things radically over, for, you know, for lesbian and gay families over the last 30 years. That's, that's a legacy to be proud of, isn't it? Any other questions? Christine? We started with the hardest question, I think. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, we've got a mic coming to you. <clears throat> Hello, Christine. Uh, Hi, okay. uh, thank you so much. I, I, I could have just listened to the story of your life for one hour. So, that, <laughs> so there, it was as interesting as your research. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Fabian. I was, I was uh, reflecting on, 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 uh, on the fact that, uh, to me, and perhaps not to you, that the LGBTQ plus community, it, 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 more than a community, is a collective of communities. And, I agree. And, and so I was reflecting, uh, and, and I was wondering whether in your research you had the opportunity to see patterns across different communities, if you allow me these terms, within the LGBT collective, mm. uh, or, or uh, whether similarities were stronger than differences across these different lived experiences. That's a really good question, and, and I absolutely agree with you. There is not one community. There are many different communities, and it's one of the reasons why um, the, uh, if, you, if you go back to um, the, one of the first slides where I've got a couple of the books on that I've written, um, Helen Coses Brown, who's here in the audience, and I wrote um, a, a book about social work with lesbians and gay men, and we, we um, did that on purpose because we knew that there were different experiences for those who were bisexual and certainly for trans and non-binary people, and, and we didn't want to do the LGBT plus thing um, and, uh, and not address the, the issues there, so that was why we wrote that book, and it's been a really, um, I've learned a lot from um, doing research with Trish over the last two or three years around trans and non-binary communities um, and, and some of the issues that they face, and there are some similarities, but there are a great deal of differences too uh, in terms of their parenting experience. Um, so I, I would agree with you. There are different, there are differences. There are some similarities um, in, in terms of some of the uh, negative experiences that trans families will um, uh, experience. But uh, yes, there's a lot of differences too. Thank you. Um, can I just add something? To it. Well, I mean, one of the one of the obviously the difficulties that we have in social work research is that it's very English language dominated, um, and and that means that a lot of the research sites are in English speaking countries often, and and one of the interesting things in terms of um, particularly outcomes for children growing up in lesbian and gay transgender. Um, households is that there are huge similarities across English-speaking nations, so New Zealand, Australia, the States, Canada, and the UK. Um, and we know, what, um, that, you know that's interesting in itself, but what we don't know is outcomes for other languages. Yeah. <laughs> such mean. So it is, we, we have, like in lots of our research, we have this problematic biased, we, we know a lot more about those nations and the outcomes for particular groups, and that's certainly the case in this research as well. So it goes back to whose stories are being told. Yeah, that's a really powerful no, issue totally. here. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's, it's really interesting you say that, because one of the... I, I have enjoyed so much the EU projects that I've been part of. They've just um, been so interesting for so many different um, reasons. 
Um, and the project that Trish and I uh, were part of that looked at homophobia in schools, oh my God, the, the, the stories from places like Bulgaria were heartbreaking, even from Italy. Some of the, uh, it was just incredible, um, the, the challenging situations in which um, people found themselves. And I think that it's quite sobering, it's like the, the, the purposeful use of that word, um, very early on in my talk, because it, it, it does remind me, although, you know, I had some pretty weird experiences here, it, I, my life hasn't been under threat um, a, a, as it has for many parents in, in some other European nations, and that's, that's very sobering. Yeah. Any, any other questions? I don't know if we had any questions online. I just want to double check. Yeah, maybe another comment or question, yeah. Oh, yeah, there is one. There's one coming in online as well. No, please go ahead first. And then do the one online? Okay, can we have the question from the, from the back, please? Thank you. Uh, this question comes from Alfonso. What is your view on social work education, and why are we still not talking about LGBT plus, ooh, plus parenting and adoption in our social work classes? That's a very interesting question, Alfonso. Um, uh, Alfonso uh, comes from Middlesex University. He's an academic there. So um, thanks for the question, Alfonso. Um, I think that there has been a change um, uh, around how social work courses are addressing this. I think it's um, largely dependent on the staff who are within um, schools often. If there's a, a, a critical mass, shall we say, and a critical interest of that, then, then um, it's more likely to, to be raised and, and addressed. What was really interesting was last year, there's a couple of students at the University of Birmingham that deserve a mention because they went and met with some um, staff at the University of Birmingham. Jason Schaub um, was the um, academic there um, and went and spoke to Social Work England about the fact that Alfonso is raising. And, and I think we do need to find ways of integrating these sorts of um, issues into our curriculum, most definitely. And I think some courses are better at doing that than others. We need to make sure all courses are good at doing that. And I trust our course here at UEA <laughs> gives appropriate recognition to these issues, yeah. yeah. Um, please do go ahead with your question. I was, I was just struck by your daughter's comment about the lesbian mafia. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just wondered whether the, I mean, this, I, I don't know, and I just wondered if, if you knew, or you'd, in the work you've done, whether actually children in um, um, queer families um, are, who are part of a wider community to, uh, of, of, of other families that feel familiar or similar mm. to them, um, whether there's any difference there from being in a family that's very isolated. Do, do you see what I mean? Whether, I think, th I so think there is. The, whether yeah. the mafia bit, and I don't know that we should be using that term, but you know what I mean, the community bit makes a difference or not. I think it does make a difference, and, I, and, and that's again going back to this issue about whose stories are, are being told. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to, to, to be and live in a very middle-class community. I have a choice about where I live, and I knew that when I wanted to have children, I wanted to be somewhere where we weren't the only lesbian family um, in the community, and we are not. And, and, but for some people, that's, that's just not their experience. They are, and that's a very different experience. And if you're from a different class background, you don't have the choice over where you live that, um, that um, many middle class um, people do. So I think there's a whole other complexity to that, which is why we need to find ways of being able to tell those stories and understand um, how community works for those people, how people use their communities, because I have a feeling it's in a very different way. We've got one more question uh, online, please. Thanks for the sharing the mic. Somebody's put, great talk, Christine. My non-binary teen sitting beside me would like to draw on your experience to understand how they can deal with transphobia outside the family circle. Wow, that's an amazing question. I, I would say, you know, unfortunately, homophobia and transphobia are very real 
um, and uh, what helps and has helped me is having really good friendships and knowing where support is available and knowing that it's not you that's the one who has got the problem, it's that definitely the other, the other person who's got a, a, a pretty, pretty blinkered view. Um, and, and so that's what I would say to them, be who you want to be, be um, uh, true to yourself, that's the most important thing. I think that's just a terrific place <laughs> to, to let you off the hook, actually, Thank you. these questions. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. I enjoyed the social work professor part, <laughs> talking about the relations and the structure of belonging, and it was, it was great to see that. And, um, and you definitely linked that with some of your own story. You stimulated us all, really, to think about family and what family is for us, our many versions of family. Um, I find, found it inspiring and very proud to have you in your scholarly work here. Um, and I also found it moving as a lesbian parent and now a parent of a lesbian parent. It's true. Um, I'd like to thank you for your groundbreaking research, practice, leadership, and advocacy in this space over what is now decades. Um, so please join me in recognizing Professor Christine Cocker and join her for a, and us all for a celebratory drink in the foyer. Thank you very thank much, you. Christine. Thank you. Thank you.